Hello. <laughs> One of the most distinct memories I have as a kid is my mom sliding me a particularly foul-smelling bowl of gray matter. <laughs> Trust me, it tastes just like tofu, <laughs> she tells me after I ask her why there's an empty container labeled pork brain sitting on the counter. <laughs> Trust me, it doesn't taste like tofu. <laughs> Growing up in America as a Chinese kid, I was felt a constant need to blend into the culture that surrounded me and reject the one I had at home. Always having had an affinity towards food, I'd find myself constantly asking my mom why we couldn't have the exotic American delicacies I saw families on TV eating as I sat down to a table full of braised meats, steamed fish, and stir-fried vegetables. I just wanted to eat hot pockets like Dave, drink milk like Brett. <laughs> I don't understand why I couldn't be more like the kids at school. <laughs> as I grew older, my love and hunger for food and cooking only grew and I knew I wanted to learn more in an actual restaurant. I didn't know too much about the restaurant scene in my area at the time, so I literally went on Yelp and looked up every $4 restaurant <laughs> in my area. I emailed each and every single one of them, asking them if I could work for them over the summer. To my surprise, the only ones that got back to me were the ones with Michelin stars. I'll never forget the moment that I walked through the side doors of the restaurant into the bustling kitchen full of the brigade of cooks and dishwashers. Man, they all look like giants to me. I watched in awe as the cooks frantically finished their prep, slicing and dicing onions and carrot at a pace you wouldn't even think humanly possible. They all moved with this type of grace and composure I'd never really seen before. Before then, the only cooks I'd really ever seen were old, angry Asian men angrily screaming obscenities in Vietnamese before haphazardly slapping chicken on the most disgusting grill you've ever seen. <laughs> I listened to the symphony of pots and pans clanging on the stove, the shouts of hot, behind, corner. <laughs> I was floored by the smells of the stocks being simmered away, onions being sweated off, fresh breads being baked in the oven. And just like the first time I saw Sally Park in the fourth grade, I was in love. <laughs> The head chef pulled me aside and took me around the kitchen and dining room. He told me to come in and work one day, and if I liked it, to just keep coming back. And so I did, and one day turned to two, two to three, and then quickly I'd spent months learning under the pastry chefs at two different Michelin star restaurants, prepping and plating for each dinner service. Beyond just solidifying my passion for food and cooking, I saw how all the cooks and chefs around me would use their own backgrounds and cultural experiences to help express themselves as cooks. Slowly, I began to realize how unique my own culture was and how unique my own experiences were and how great a resource it was for me to be able to express myself on a plate. In Kung Fu Panda, <laughs> when Po, the panda who dreams of being the coveted Kung Fu legend dragon warrior, finally receives the dragon scroll that's supposed to grant Po the mythical Kung Fu powers, he opens up the scroll just to find out it's a reflection of himself. That was my Kung Fu Panda scroll moment. <laughs> what I had sought for was within me all along. I fell in love with food and cooking, not through the culture that I wanted so badly to assimilate into, but through the one that I was so eager to write off. I fell in love with food and cooking, not through the culture that I wanted so badly to assimilate into, but through the one I was so eager to write off. These were the experiences that ultimately led me to create my own pop-up restaurant in my studio apartment. Doing pop-up dinners was always something that was on my college bucket list. I remember in high school, I'd watch all these articles and see all these videos of people in college cooking and selling food out of their college dorms, and I figured, I feel like I could do that too. <laughs> it wasn't until I got my own studio apartment did I really think it was possible. I just finished a short stage at a two Michelin star restaurant in San Francisco that actually started off as a pop-up restaurant. I spent the rest of my summer carefully curating the experience I wanted my guests to have in my bedroom. Well, pop-up restaurant. <laughs> 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 I spent months developing the menu, gathering the silverware, plateware, glassware, and service pieces. I'd go anywhere for kitchen things, from thrift stores to three Michelin star restaurants, asking if I could buy their used Bernardo plates or mother of pearl spoons. 
I even raided my mom's old tea cabinet so I could have special Chinese tea to serve my after meal sweets. I wanted to combine the right amount of fine dining experience with the, wow, I'm in some college dude's house <laughs> experience <laughs> as best I could. My idea was to serve a seven course tasting menu for four people once a week, cooking food that was local, sustainable, seasonal, and organic, and food that was really, truly tasty and reflective of who I am. I wanted to combine the flavors I, I loved growing up with the techniques I learned working in restaurants to create some really, truly unique and exciting dishes. One of these dishes is my 62 degree tea egg. <laughs> Looking at all the great chefs in the world, I saw how they all had their own signature egg dishes, like Alain Passard's Arpege egg, a carefully topped eggshell filled with a poached yolk topped with a luscious savory cream and herbs, or David Chang's Momofuku Ko egg, a slow poached egg served with fingerling potato chips and caviar. Inspired by both these chefs, I figured I should have my own signature egg dish. Growing up, I'd always loved the flavor of a traditional Chinese tea egg. A Chinese tea egg is basically an egg that's been hard-boiled and steeped in the solution of tea and soy for so long that the flavor permeates throughout the entire egg and creates for a super delicious egg. However, the thing that kind of always bothered me about the egg is that because of this boiling and steeping process, it always created for a rather overcooked egg as well. The yolk would be rather chalky and hard, while the white would be kind of rubbery and not super pleasant. So I explored different techniques to create a dish surrounding a runny yolked tea egg. What I settled on was an egg that I have to cook in three different stages just to be able to properly infuse the egg with that tea flavor, yet maintain a nice soft white and a perfectly jammy yolk. This is the uh, tea egg I serve at my restaurant. Um, it's an egg that's been steeped in lapsang sushing, which is a Chinese smoked black tea. Um, it's served with some Chinese red vinegar, scallions, mushrooms, and a stick of toasted brioche just to be able to scoop up all that perfectly jammy yolk. This was a dish that truly embodied what I wanted to convey to guests, showcasing my childhood food memories through my own unique lens. However, it was a while before I was even able to think about putting out a dish like the tea egg. Beginning, when I was first starting doing the pop-up, I was just so focused on making sure my guests were having a good experience that I wasn't taking any extraordinary risks with the food I was serving for fear that people would completely reject what I was doing. Honestly, I thought I would have to beg my friends each week to come eat at my place when I started doing the pop-up. <laughs> to my surprise, when I put out my first round of reservations through my Instagram, I was fully booked for two months within a couple of hours. So I stuck with it, doing it week after week, and people seemed to really care about and enjoy what I was doing. Soon, the school newspaper came out with an article, and shortly I saw myself on publications like Food Beast, Insider, Now This, and even on The Chew. I'd wake up to a flood of messages and comments of support and interest. I thought I was for sure going to get evicted. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I first started doing the pop-up, I'd always joke with my friends that I was one day going to cook for President Armstrong. Well. One thing led to another, and during one of the last dinners I did last year, I found myself serving President Armstrong in my tiny studio apartment, where he dined just about three feet away from my bed. <laughs> Ice cube blasting away in the background. <laughs> it was definitely a good day. <laughs> it was just surreal to me to think that me cooking in my apartment had piqued the interests of so many, even the president of the university. I'm so thankful to God for the opportunity to share who I am with others, and I'm humbled by the support I feel from people all over the world, especially those in my community. I guess it was all worth it, those late nights making chocolate bonbons at 2 in the morning, daydreaming about dishes during class. Sorry, Dr. Wilkinson, for having to teach me the same thing two quarters in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and missing out on all the time I could have spent with family and friends. I learned how much my culture and identity means to me and how I want to share that with others through food. I may never like pork brain soup, but I'm grateful for all the experiences I had growing up. Food has taught me how important it can be in the discovering of the value of my upbringing and the shaping of my identity. I didn't let the culture that surrounded me dictate who I was. Instead, I embraced my own. Learning to love my culture sure took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but look how far I've come. 
Who knows? Maybe Sally Park will finally call me. <laughs>